Welcome back. We are in uh, the Wife of Bath's tale, and I'm with you on page 142. Let's just remind ourselves where we've been. If we are trying to draw up the plot line of this story, we will say the following. A. Knight rapes young girl. B. King says off with his head. C. Queen says not so fast. King says okay. Queen says to Knight, I want you to answer a question for the women of the court. What is it all women most desire? Take a year and a day and find the answer. The next part of our story is simple. The knight goes on a quest. Let's go ahead and put it in our notes. Let's point out how Chaucer is playing with the idea of the knight's quest. Now, instead of going out on a quest for the Holy Grail, right, to somehow save King Arthur's health and, the, and, and of course all of England. Now our knight has to go off on this silly kind of quest where he's, he has to come to the answer, what is it that all women most desire? The answers abound, all kinds of crazy answers. The poor knight has no answer and so he's ready to go back home now and I'm with you on page 142. He's ready to go back home and have his head chopped off. I'm with you now on page 142, read along with me. Line 130. This night I'm telling you about, perceived at last, he never would find out what it could be that women loved the best. Faint was the soul within his sorrowful breast. As home he went, he dared no longer stay. His year was up, and now it was the day. Line 135. Now the next twist in the story. As he rode home in a dejected mood, suddenly, at the margin of a wood, he saw a dance upon the leafy floor of four and twenty ladies, nay and more, eagerly he approached and hoped to learn some words of wisdom ere he, could ere he should return. But lo, before he came to where they were, dancers and dance all vanished into air. There wasn't a living creature to be seen save one old woman crouched upon the green. A fowler looking creature, I suppose, could scarcely be imagined. So in other words, he's, he's riding home. This sucks. I'm going to have my head chopped off because I can't find the answer to the stupid question, what is it every woman on the planet wants? And then all of a sudden he sees a bunch of beautiful women dancing in a ring. And then he gets off his pony. He, he walks over there. But when he gets there, all of the women vanish. And the only thing left there is this old but ugly woman sitting there. Right? He kind of goes, ooh. I thought I, was, I thought I saw, like, Victoria's Secret uh, models dancing around on the green, and now I see this really but ugly old lady. Whoops, sorry about that. Notice, now she is going to stand up because she's kind of squatting down. She arose, line 147, and said, Sir Knight, there's no way on from here. Tell me what you are looking for, my dear. For peradventure, that were best for you. We old, old women know a thing or two. Dear mother, said the knight, alack the day. I am as good as dead if I can't say what thing it is that women most desire. If you could tell me, I would pay your hire. Give me your hand, she said, and swear to do whatever I shall next require of you, if so to do should lie within your might, and you shall know the answer before night. Upon my honor, he answered, I agree, top of page 143. Then said the crone, the old lady, I dare to guarantee my life. Your life is safe. I shall make good my claim. Upon my life, the queen will say the same. Show me the very proudest of them all in costly cover chief or jeweled call that dare say no to what I have to teach. Let us go forward without further speech. And then she crooned her gospel in his ear and told him to be glad and not to fear. So the next part of our story is very simple. The knight thinks that he sees a bunch of beautiful, gorgeous women dancing in the woods. He wants to go look at them. When he gets there, it's a butt ugly old woman. And she's like, honey, what's wrong with you? And he says, oh, you can't even imagine the year I've had. I'm about to get my head chopped off because I can't come up with no answer to the question, what is it all women most desire? And she says, oh, that's no problem. I can, I can fix that for you. But you have to make a deal with me. Shake hands. Make a deal with me that I'll save your life, but you got to give me whatever it is I request. And he's like, yeah, 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 anything, anything. Let's continue. They came to court this night in full array, stood forth and said, Oh, queen, I've kept my day and kept my word and have my answer 
ready. Now, some will argue that this moment is the climax of the story because we well, obviously we want to know what's going to be the answer. Is he going to get the right answer or the wrong answer? But an astute reader of this story will already know he's clearly going to get the right answer. Why? Because of the old lady who, remember what she said? We old women know a thing or two, right? Which kind of takes us back. We can point this out at 3A already. Kind of takes us back to that observation that was made, remember, in the partner's tale? Remember? Where an old man was suggested to know some things that a young man should show respect. All right. What will be the answer to the question, what is it all women want? And obviously at 3B, we can ask ourselves whether we agree or disagree with this answer. There set the noble matrons and the heady young girls and widows too that have the grace of wisdom all assembled in that place, line 175. And there the queen herself was thrown to hear and judge his answer. Then the knight drew near and silence was commanded through the hall. The queen then bade the knight to tell them all what thing it was that women most wanted. He stood not silent like a beast or post, but gave his answer with the ringing word of a man's voice in the assembly heard. Here we go. Here is the answer. You maybe want to write this down at level one. This is the answer of what is it all women most want at line 183. My legion lady in general, said he, a woman wants the self same sovereignty over her husband as over her lover and master him. He must not be above her. That is your greatest wish. Whether you kill or spare me, please yourself, I wait your will. Now let's pause for a moment and jot down the answer to the question. The answer to the question is an interesting one. The answer to the question is, all women want the self-same sovereignty over her husband or her lover. In other words, Women want to be able to tell men what to do, and they will just do it. They won't fight. They won't whine. They won't complain. A woman wants to be able to tell a man what to do, and he says, fine, done. Whatever it is they want, they just tell the guy to do it. And the guy says, done. I'll do that. She, he says, that's what women all want, control over their men. Let's jot down what this really is suggesting. What Chaucer is suggesting is turning the patriarchy upside down. Instead of men having the power to tell women what to do, women want the power to tell men what to do, to control them in some way. Watch how this works in high school culture. Bunch of guys, Friday afternoon, dude, come on, to one of the guys. Come on, man, you got to come with us. And the guy goes, no, nah, I can't. And one of the guys in the group does this. Now, see, this is funny. Here, we're not, we're not in 1400. We're, we're a little bit beyond 1400. Would you agree with me? What does mean when a guy or a group of guys does that to one of the guys who says, guys, I can't go out with you tonight. I got to hang with my girl. Means what? In other words, you are whipped. What is wrong with you? You're clearly no real man because a real man would not be told what to do by his girl. To which, of course, often the response is, yeah, well, uh, I'm going to hang with my girl while you guys all have to hang with each other. Thanks very much. I'm going to enjoy my experience this evening on that count. This is going to take us then, this discussion is going to take us to the, go ahead and write it in your notes, attack on the patriarchy. This idea that men should be able to tell women what to do. And we're also going to see an interesting attack on nobility and the idea that young people are better than old people. So we're going to see Chaucer doing some really remarkable stuff now going forward in the story. But first, let's get back to the story. He has just told the women in the court, basically all women want to be able to control their men. That's what they really want. They don't want to have to fight with their men. They don't want to have to be told by their men what to do. They want to be able to tell their guys, do this, do that, and they'll just do it. Oh, we might even say do it happily, right? In all the court, I'm with you on page 143 now. Keep reading with me, line 190. In all the court, not one that shook her head or contradicted what the knight had said. Maid, wife, and widow cried, he saved his life. In other words, all the women agree. Yeah, he's right, that's what we want. And on the word, up started the old wife. The one the knight saw sitting on the green and cried, your mercy, sovereign, lady queen, before the court disperses, do me right. 
'Twas I who taught this answer to the knight, for which he swore and pledged his honor to it, that the first thing I ask of him, he do it, so far as I should, as so far as it should lie within his might. Before this court, I ask you then, Sir Knight, top of page 145, to keep your word and take me for your wife. For well you know that I have saved your life. If this be false, deny it on your sword. So let's write it in our notes at level one, the next part of our story. The knight saves his life. All the women go, yeah, that's what we want. We want to be able to tell our men what to do and they do it. And all of a sudden the knight's like, Phew. dodge that bullet and he's ready to walk out. When all of a sudden the butt ugly old lady steps up and says, whoa, 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 wait a second. The only reason he got that answer is because of me. I gave him that answer. And we had an agreement. The agreement was he'd do whatever I requested. I want him to marry me. And you can imagine the poor knight, right? He just kind of looks at this butt ugly old lady and he's like, no, no way. He's like, okay, so here I was. Um, I was I, I was doomed, and now I'm and now I'm like doomed a second time, we might say, right? In other words, now I'm jacked. Notice, alas, he said, alas means. <sighs> I like that. Alas, he said, O lady by the Lord, I know indeed that such was my behest, but for God's love, think of a new request. In other words, what does she say? She says, hey, hey, hey. Uh, or he says, hey, do anything. Take anything. I do not care. Whatever happens, just don't. No, don't make me have to marry you. That's the last thing that I want to do. Take all my goods, but leave my body free. In other words, oh, no, no. Yeah, I'll pay money. Will you take money? I'll, I'll, I'll pay you a lot of money. But whatever you do, don't make me have to marry you. Ugh. To which, notice she says, a curse on us, she said, if I agree. I may be foul, that is to say ugly, I may be poor and old, yet will not choose to be for all the gold that's bedded in the earth or lies above, less than your wife, nay, than your very love. In other words, she says, I'm going to do you one better. You're not just going to marry me, you're going to fall in love with me. Yes. To which he responds, my love, notice, said he, by heaven, my damnation, alas, that any of my race and station should ever make so foul a misalliance. In other words, no, 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 no. Knights don't marry disgusting but ugly old women. Knights marry beautiful Victoria's Secret models. We don't marry you. Notice, yet in the end, his pleading and defiance, all in for nothing, he was forced to wed. He takes his ancient wife and goes to bed. So in other words, the, so, so they have to get married because that was the promise the knight made. And now we have wedding night where you have the butt ugly old lady get in, in her little outfit, her little nightgown, and jump into bed. And she's ready now to go to bed with this beautiful, good-looking knight. The knight, on the other hand, well, you can pretty much predict how he's going to perceive this whole, this whole thing. Let's go ahead and keep going. Now, preadventure. Some may well suspect a lack of care in me, since I neglect to tell of the rejoicings and display made at the feast upon their wedding day. I have but a short answer to let fall. I say there was no joy or feast at all, nothing but heaviness of heart and sorrow. He married her in private on the morrow, and all day long stayed hidden like an owl. It was such torture that his wife looked foul. In other words... Uh, the knight, he's got no interest in this project at all. She, of course, is all excited. Yippee, I'm going to have a marriage night. Yay. He's like, okay, really? I could have had my head chopped off and it would be better than what I got to endure now. Great was the anguish churning in his head when he and she were piloted to bed. He wallowed back and forth in desperate style. His ancient wife lay smiling all the while. At last she said, bless us. Is this, dear, my dear, how knights and wives get on together here? Are these the laws of good King Arthur's house? Are knights of his also contemptuous? I am your own beloved and your wife. I am she indeed that saved your life, and certainly I never did you wrong. Then why this first of knights so sad a song? Top of page 146. You're carrying on as if you were half-witted. Say for God's love, what sin have I committed? I'll put things right. If you will tell me how, let's pause for a moment, level one. She says, dude, what is up with all of this? 
this whining, this complaining, this crying. What is up with all of this? Come on, are you kidding me? I'll make everything right. I'll make everything right. She says, I saved your life. You should be happy with me as your wife. Put right, he cried the night. Put right? That never can be now. Nothing can ever be put right again. You're old and so abominably plain. You're but ugly. So poor to start with. So low-bred to follow. It's little wonder if I should twist and wallow. God, that my heart would burst within my breast. Now, let's write it in our notes at level one because this is going to be significant. He will insult her on several counts. We want to write these insults down, right? So you have a knight who is insulting his wife. For what? Notice he will say it. First of all, you're old. This is the geriatric argument. Look at you. You're old. I'm young. Come on. Notice the next one. So abominably plain means you're ugly. Earlier the word was foul. In other words, oh man, I just, I, I can't imagine having to look at that. Okay. Look at the next one. Poor. Whoa. She's got no money. In other words, you didn't even have a dowry when I married you. Look at this. You had nothing. You don't, you bring nothing to the table economically. Right. And then finally, the last one. So low bread. Whoa, 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 low bread, what does that mean? That means she comes from no nobility, from no family. In other words, she is a complete nobody. And that bugs him. Why? Because he's a knight. And he's supposed to marry, you know, somebody that's maybe upper class, maybe somebody that has a family that's nobility. That is to say, you don't even know what a country club is, much less have your own parking spot there. You've probably never even been to a country club before. Look at you. Yuck. Her response. Is that, she said, the cause of your unrest? Yes, certainly, he said. And can you wonder? In other words, do you blame me? I mean, you can't blame me. Look at you. Not her. I could set right what you suppose a blunder. That's if I cared to in a day or two. If I were shown more courtesy by you. Now, let's pause for a moment and you can write this down at line uh, 255 and following. We're going to have the wife or Chaucer. Remember, Chaucer makes this woman up. This is amazing, amazing stuff. Chaucer makes this woman up in 1350. This woman didn't exist. Chaucer, a man, put these words in this woman's mouth, the wife of Bath. The wife of Bath is telling a story about an old woman who's about to give a lecture to a young knight. Courtesy is the word. Courtesy, in other words, respect, being nice. But now she's going to lecture. Let's put it in her notes at level one. She is going to lecture this young kid, and she's going to say, let me tell you a thing or two, son. And she's now going to give a series of observations that in your notes at level one, we are definitely going to want to categorize by different kinds of criticism for different kinds of views. Just now, she said, you spoke of gentle birth, such as descends from ancient wealth and worth. In other words, she starts with this notion of being a gentleman. In Chaucer's day, you are a gentleman because you are born into a wealthy family, a family of power. That's how you become a gentleman, okay? And in England of the day, they even will sometimes show this by the clothes that they wear and by maybe, for example, a patch or a crest that you would have on that would show you are above other people. Are you ready for this? If you were of the upper class and you walked down the sidewalk and you, and you met somebody who was not of the upper class, that somebody had to step out of the way, get out of your way because you were upper class. Notice what she says about this. This, by the way, is the attack on nobility. Write it down as that. This is the notion of the attack on nobility, what it means to be noble, what it means to be a true gentleman. Notice she says, just now, you said, you spoke of gentle birth, such as descends from ancient wealth and worth. If that's the claim you make for gentlemen, such arrogance is hardly worth a hint. Arrogant, to think you're better than someone else. Whoever loves to work for virtuous ends, public and private, and who most intends to do what deeds of gentleness he can, take him to be the greatest gentleman. Whoa, let's put it in our notes really quickly at level one. She says, gentlemen are not born gentlemen. You're not born noble. 
You become a gentleman when you know how to treat people with respect. The code language here is, you're clearly not treating me with respect right now. She keeps going. Christ wills. We take our gentleness from him, not from a wealth of ancestry long dead, though they bequeath their whole establishment by which we claim to be of high descent. Our fathers cannot make us a bequest of all those virtues that became them best and earned for them the name of gentlemen, but bade us follow them as best we can. Let's write it in our notes. She says, you do not inherit from your parents and your grandparents, nobility. No. Just because your great grandma was a really nice person does not mean that you will be. Just because your mother is an unbelievably kind person does not mean that you will be. In other words, she says to this young kid, you must choose to be a gentleman. And that means you have to treat people with respect, even if they're of low birth. Even if they're not from your class. We would, of course, today continue this by saying, even if they're not of the same race as you, right? In other words, this notion that you think you're better than somebody else because of skin color or because of money, she's going to say, got nothing to do with it whatsoever. Thus, the wise poet of the Florentines, Dante by name, another allusion, has written in these lines, for such is the opinion Dante launches, quote, seldom arises by these slender branches prowess of men, for it is God no less wills us to claim of him our gentleness, end quote. For of our parents nothing can we claim save, save temporal things, and these may hurt and maim. She makes a very interesting observation. Sometimes being born to wealthy or powerful parents hurts the kid, not helps the kid. Makes them kind of mean makes them not very nice at all. That is to say, you want to know where a bully comes from? A bully comes often from a mom or a dad or a family that teaches the kid 